All right, well, I'd love to talk with you today about the times when life surprises you. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, Elf. It's one of our favorites at our house, favorite Christmas movie. Will Ferrell's the main character. He thinks he's an elf, but he's clearly a human. He's like six foot three or something. He's this huge guy. And there's this moment that you just saw where he realizes he's not an elf, he's a human, and his whole world comes crashing down. I was thinking about this the other day. My kids were playing this game called Jenga. I don't know if you've ever played Jenga. Here's a picture of my kids and some of their friends playing Jenga. It's this wooden block tower, and there's all these blocks, and each person on their turn has to pull out a block. And of course, every time another block gets pulled out, the tower becomes a little more tenuous, a little more likely to tip over, and it starts to tilt, it starts to lean. And with each pull of the block, you know, each person is kind of, you know, hoping that the tower's not going to fall down. And I was watching my kids play Jenga the other day, and I was watching their suspense and their emotion. I got thinking, you know, it's a lot like our lives, because in life we're all building a tower of dreams, We're all building a tower of dreams and we go about life and we think the tower will just keep getting better and better, but life throws us these curveballs, these unexpected changes, and all of a sudden our tower of dream topples over. What can you do when the whole thing comes crashing down? The holidays for how fun they are with all the joy and the warmth and the lights, it's a time where if your tower of dreams has fallen over, it's very painful. It's a time where if there are gaps, if there are blocks missing, if there are empty chairs in the room or empty spaces around the table, that it's hard. And God brought you here today because he wants you to know that whether your tower in life is tipping over or even if it's completely fallen down and the pieces are scattered and you think, what do I even do now? God wants you to know today that he loves you, that he has the power to rebuild what's broken in your life, and that when life throws an unexpected change your way, he has the power to help and he's eager to help. Here's the question we're wrestling with today. What can you do when an unwanted surprise shatters your well-planned life? What can you do when an unwanted surprise shatters your well-planned life? So many families in our church, so many individuals are experiencing this right now in different ways. Sometimes it's an in-law that is making choices that affect your kids or your grandkids, or it's a health diagnosis. Other times it's the loss of a loved one, and, and life knocks over our tower of dreams And all of a sudden, where we've been planning and everything was going to work out right, now it's a giant mess and we don't even know how to move forward. There's a couple right now in our church family who are inspiring me, Mark and Shannon, because this happened to them. They were pregnant and they were planning on a normal, full pregnancy and a healthy birth, but their child, Bryson, came early by a matter of months and when he was born he was just over one pound here's Shannon and her husband Mark and their baby Bryson and as I've been walking with them as we as a church have been walking with them I've been seeing them wrestle with this question in a way that's full of faith but also fully honest with the struggles of life what can you do when an unwanted surprise shatters your well-planned life. Well, I'll tell you more about Mark and Shannon's story as we answer this question. But I wonder, does the word of God speak to this? If God answers this question for the dreams in your life that have toppled over, would you wanna know his answer to that question? Well, believe it or not, in the Christmas story, we've been reading through Luke chapter one, and we've been learning in this series that God is with us. Christmas is all about God coming to earth to be with us, to feel what it's like to be inside a human body and to cry our tears, to be rejected by people we love, to feel our pain. Christmas is all about God being with us. And we're learning in this series that God is with the people who seek him and who believe in him, even when life is difficult. Last week, we saw that in disappointment, God is not absent. We learned about an 
old couple named Zachariah and Elizabeth, and their lifelong dream had been to have kids. And for 30 years, they lived in disappointment. That dream seemed impossible. It became impossible. And then an angel showed up and said, Zachariah, your wife Elizabeth is going to get pregnant, and she's going to have a baby who will be the prophet who will point to the Messiah. That baby's name would be John the Baptist. We left off at the end of that incredible story, how they continued to believe in God, even in their disappointment, how God had not forsaken them or forgotten them in their disappointment. And today we're going to pick up at verse 26 of Luke chapter 1. Here's what it says. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. Now, Mary was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph. Joseph was a descendant from King David. That's a major figure in God's story in what we call the Old Testament, who wrote a lot of the Bible and who was a picture in a lot of ways of God when he would come as king of kings. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. And I want to pause there for a moment because we had a very similar, almost identical moment in last week's story where if we, if we look at this, it almost seems like they contradict. Because right here we're told that Mary's confused and disturbed. And I don't know what unexpected thing has happened in your life. I don't know where your Jenga tower of dreams has gotten knocked over, but if you're like me, when that happens, you're feeling confused and you're feeling disturbed. And that's exactly how Mary feels. Because as this angel starts to say God's plan for her life, it's going to completely destroy her version of her dream life. Mary's confused, Mary's disturbed, and yet she has found favor with God. And we saw this with Zechariah and Elizabeth, that they had God's favor, they were righteous in God's eyes, even when they were living in disappointment. You need to know today that when life is confusing, when life is disturbing, that you still can have God's favor. It doesn't mean God has turned his back on you. All the heroes of God's story went through difficult times. And Mary will go through difficult times as she fulfills God's purpose for her, but we're going to see in Mary a faith that is real about her emotions, but doesn't allow her emotions to control her decisions. She rises above her confusion. She rises above the ways that she's disturbed by what's happening. And we're gonna see that she chooses to believe. You can be confused and still be under God's favor. The angel says this next, you will conceive, you'll get pregnant, and you will give birth to a son. And you'll name him Jesus. He'll be very great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor, David. So Mary had been raised Jewish and like her great grandparents and her parents, she was looking forward to this God on earth Messiah. And Mary, knowing God's promises, is starting to realize this son that she's gonna have, he's not just gonna be a powerful prophet. These titles like son of the most high and throne of David, she's realizing the baby she's going to have will be the Messiah, not only of the Jewish people, but of all nations. And he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Well, Mary asks the angel a pretty reasonable question when he says, you're going to get pregnant and have this child. She says, how can this happen? How could I get pregnant when I'm a virgin? Now, the other night I was reading this story with my kids. They are ages four, six, and nine. You, see, you guys see where I'm going with this. <laughs> and they said, Dad, what's a virgin? And I said, this is why I love reading the Bible with my kids. You know, this is great. And on the spot, I'm thinking, okay, Lord, give me wisdom. So, so I actually thought, you know, we watch a lot of nature documentaries about animals in the ocean, and we read books about animals, and so I'm going to try this and see if it works. I said, you guys know how animals mate to reproduce? Yeah. I was like, well, a virgin is just a human who has never mated. And they were like, okay. <laughs> I was like, you know, bullet dodged. 
<laughs> Bullet dodged for the time being. So Mary says, you know, um, this is a great idea, angel. This is a great promise. I'm a little bit overwhelmed. I'm, I'm confused, but this is impossible. There's no way that this could actually happen. And you, you, if we put ourselves in Mary's position, right now in her mind, she's realizing my entire life is being thrown into disarray. I mean, even in our culture, which does not take marriage nearly as seriously as this culture did, even in our culture, if you could imagine right now, if you were a young woman and you were engaged and all of a sudden you became pregnant and an angel told you it was from God, but your fiance knows for a fact that it's not from your fiance, you can imagine going to that fiance and saying, uh, hey, honey, I've got some interesting news. I'm pregnant, but don't worry. It's from God. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't cheat on you or anything. It's a divine miracle. Can, can you imagine what's going through Mary's head? I mean, in our culture, that would probably mean there's not going to be a wedding and there's going to be a lot of consequences. But in this culture, I mean, this is a culture where a, a girl who that happens to becomes damaged goods. She would never be able to marry anyone if Joseph breaks off the wedding. She, she doesn't have an education like nowadays. She doesn't have women's rights like nowadays. She's, she's going to live the rest of her life either in poverty or as a prostitute if Joseph gets rid of her because she got pregnant. And in this moment, she's processing, okay, God, you're telling me this, but what you're telling me is impossible, and what you're telling me means that I will very likely be rejected, be mocked, possibly even be ruined. You talk about your Jenga Tower of Dreams getting upset. The angel replies to Mary and says this, here's how it's gonna work. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High, that is God, will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. Now, if Mary hasn't caught it by this point, it's clear your child will be the Messiah, God among us. And it's very important, I won't spend too much time on it, but it's very important, actually, that Jesus did not have a human father. You see, the story of humanity, God tells us beginning at the start of his love letter to us, the Bible, in the book of Genesis, he says that he created humans to be immortal beings. We were never supposed to die. We were never supposed to have cancer or sickness. And we were supposed to be in relationship with him and each other in a perfect sense, in an eternal, ongoing sense. So why is it that we have divorce and why do we have cancer? Why do we have rape and genocide and murder and betrayal and jealousy and greed and lust? All these things were invited into our world by some of the earliest humans, Adam and Eve. When God made Adam and Eve, he said, here's the rules. I'm telling you this for your own good. There's one thing to not do, but I'm making you with a free will. You get to choose me if you want to love me or not. And at some point, if you don't want to do things my way, here's this one piece of fruit. If you eat that, it will bring death and destruction to yourself and to all your offspring. Well, Adam and Eve made that choice. It's called the Garden of Eden. It was a real literal place where they physically chose to reject God. They invited sin and death into our world. And ever since, the brokenness has been spreading like a contamination, like pollution around planet Earth and in humanity. So each of us are born, and in our DNA, we get our eye color and our hair color and our personality traits, and from our dad, apparently, I'm sorry, guys, I wish this weren't the case, but, you know, women, apparently, according to this text, when your child or grandchild sins, they get it from their dad. They don't get it from the mom, because the idea is this, that, that just as God has the power to breathe life into existence out of nothing. He has the same power to breathe life into any woman's womb at any time without a, another human being involved. God can do that. He created life in the first place. And the whole point of this, that Mary is a human who had not mated, is very significant spiritually. It means that the child born within her would not have that sin nature that we all inherit. Scripture says in Romans chapter 3 that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, whether it's the Mother Teresa, the most 
spiritual looking person you ever know, everyone has had at least one moment where they've chosen the path of sin or of self, of lust, of deceit, of pride, of greed, instead of God's path. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The beauty of the Christmas story is that a sinless child was born who was fully God and fully man, who willingly said, I will take the punishment, I will take the consequences of everyone's mistakes, and at the cross, he absorbed our judgment upon himself so that all who believe in him, we can have our records wiped clean, we can be sinless before God, we can be adopted into the family of God and have eternal life. So that's why it's so important that Jesus actually was born from a human who had never made it. And this angel says he will be called the son of God. What's more, the angel continues, your relative Elizabeth, Mary remembers Elizabeth from family reunions and other things. Elizabeth is that really old lady who mom always said she's wanted a baby for 30 or 40 years. It's such a sad story. Your relative Elizabeth has also become pregnant in her old age. Now, my same kids who I was reading this with, and they said, what is a virgin? When we got to this, one of them made this observation that I hadn't even noticed. They said, dad, this is so cool. God did a miracle for one lady who's too old to have a baby, and he did a miracle for another lady who's too young and not yet ready to have a baby. I thought, what a beautiful picture that God is longing to work through the whole spectrum of humanity, whether you're old or young, whether you feel unqualified or whether you feel like you've been waiting for 30 years, God is eager to work in your life. What God's looking for are those few people who have a high view of him and a strong faith in him and an obedience to say, God, do your work in my life and through your life. Elizabeth is pregnant. People used to say she was barren, but she's conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. I just love this verse. The word of God, the promises of God will never fail. God keeps his promises. You see, God had made a promise hundreds of years earlier that a Messiah would come. And Mary's realizing as this angel's talking to her, God's promises for hundreds of years, they're coming true now. There's an old translation of this verse that I love. It says, nothing is impossible with God. Because Mary says to the angel, okay, that sounds like a neat plan, but there's no way that could happen. And the angel says, nothing is impossible with God. God keeps his promises. God's not limited to what we think of as possible. So let's review what's happening. A sudden change has thrown Mary's life into disarray. God says he has a plan, but Mary can't see how the plan could possibly work. Mary's frightened. She doesn't see the future. She doesn't know that 2,000 years later, one out of three people in the world will celebrate her son's birth. She doesn't know that 2.4 billion people will claim to be Christians in a world of 7 billion people. She doesn't know any of that. All she knows is that her fiance is gonna have a really hard time understanding this and that God has made promises and she's frightened. She knows she'll be mocked, possibly ruined. How does she respond to God's impossible promise, here's her response. Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you've said about me come true. This is such a significant verse because this verse shows an exercise of the will. Just like Adam and Eve in the garden had a will, you have a will, you get to choose. And Mary had a will. And Mary says, I choose, even though it's scary, even though it's impossible, even though it upsets my life plan and my life dreams, I choose to say, God, I'm your servant. Go ahead and do your plan. I believe in you. I trust in you. The angel left her. So we've got an unexpected change from life, an impossible promise from God, a radical faith from Mary. Next verse says that a few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea to the town where Zechariah lived. She's going to visit Elizabeth. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. And at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child, little John the Baptist, who will someday point to Jesus and say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He leaps within her and Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? And again, we're seeing Elizabeth's character because these are real people who have the same emotions and egos as you and me. And we talked last week about after 30 years of waiting and disappointment, when Elizabeth finally gets pregnant, she could have said, well, it's about time, God. But instead she says, oh God, you've been so good to me. And it shows her submission, her faith in God. And in a similar way, Elizabeth now realizes, okay, one of those little babies who I held when I couldn't get pregnant is now a teenager. And my child, now that I finally get to have a child, his whole job is gonna be to shine the spotlight on her child. And as a human, with normal human emotions, Elizabeth could be upset about that, right? But Elizabeth sees that the story, she plays a role in it, but it's not all about her. And it's not even all about her son. It's all about God's plan to redeem humanity, to fix what's broken in humanity. And so we see again Elizabeth's heart and her choice of her will to say, I wanna be part of God's plan. She continues, when I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed, Mary, because you believed. You're blessed because you believed. You believed that the Lord would do what he said. And this is becoming a theme in this story, that God makes promises, impossible promises, and that God looks for the few people who will believe those promises. And that when we choose to believe God's impossible promises, it results in blessing for ourselves and through Mary for all nations. Good news, which will be for all people. Uh, exponential blessing results. So Mary responds, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. This is probably technically the first Christmas carol because Mary is going to just from her heart kind of say this beautiful poem. Some Christians call it the Magnificat. And early Christians, about 1900 years ago, they started to put this poem to music when they would celebrate the birth of Christ. And this is really one of the first Christmas carols. Mary says this, for he took notice of his lowly servant girl. I love it that Mary did not come from money. Mary did not come from education or opportunity. She was the lowest class in a nation of people who were subject to Roman rule. And anytime the Jewish people get a little out of line, the Romans would just send out a garrison of troops and they would just kill any, any Jewish people who were out of line. Her whole nation was subject to another nation, but within that, she was the lowest class, she was a peasant, and she was the lowest gender. She was unnoticed by a lot of people, a poor peasant girl from a nation that didn't have many rights, but God noticed her. You know, Scripture says that humans look on the outside, but God looks on the heart. And where other people saw a poor peasant girl, God saw one of those few human hearts that seek him, and that view him as big and powerful and good and loving and a heart that desires to trust in him. And God saw her. And you need to know today that God sees you. No matter what category other humans might put you in. No matter what mistakes you've made in the past, God sees you and he's just looking for this kind of faith. There's a verse where Jesus says in the Gospels, when I return the second time, not as a baby, but as a judge, will the Son of Man find faith on earth? Now the answer is yes, but the implication is he's looking. He's always looking for those few people who have a strong faith in a God who can do the impossible. Mary continues her song and says, from now on all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one is holy and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. He's looking for those who respect him. I love it that with both Mary and Elizabeth, God chose the most unexpected person to do the most important thing. And in your life, God has more important things for you to do than you probably expect. The key to unlocking those and walking in those is this faith 
this respect and reverence of God. God's always looking for these people. Mary says, his mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and the haughty ones. He's brought down princes from their thrones and he's exalted the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things and he's sent the rich away empty-handed. He has helped his servant Israel. He has remembered to be merciful for he made this promise to our ancestors. And I've highlighted this because here's what's interesting. We've seen Mary's heart in her response to God. But what we see here is that Mary, her relationship to God wasn't just about her heart, it was also about her head. In other words, she knew God's promises. She had read them, she had memorized some of them. So when the angel shows up and says, these ancient predictions about Messiah are gonna come true through you, Mary starts to connect the dots. Why? Because she's chosen to know God's promises. And these promises were to Abraham and his children forever. Well, the next verse says that Mary stayed there with Elizabeth about three months. Now, you might remember Elizabeth was six months pregnant when Mary gets there. So most likely Mary stays for John the Baptist's birth. And she sees the birth of this child who will be a cousin to her child, who will prepare the way for Messiah, and then Mary goes back home. Well, let's return to our original question. What can you do when an unwanted surprise shatters your well-planned life? And here's God's answer. When life is unexpected, I can choose God's way forward. When life is unexpected, I can expect God to work. Mary Didn't expect these things to happen, but as soon as they did, she expected, my God is good, and if these things are happening, he has a plan. He will work this for good. I will trust in him, and so I choose his way forward. You know, the longer we live, the more we realize that things will happen to us in life that we cannot control. Sometimes it's a cancer diagnosis. Sometimes it's a drunk driver crossing over the center line and hitting someone we love. Sometimes it's the choices our kids make or our grandkids make or our spouse makes. There are things in life that we can't control and no matter how much money you make, no matter how much power you accumulate, no matter how much education you get, things will happen to you in life that you can't control. And the more we focus on what we cannot control, the more depressed we become. And we can spiral deeper and deeper down by just obsessing about that choice someone made or that diagnosis, the things we can't control. But I've learned this as I've read the word of God and as I've done my best imperfectly to walk with him. There's a lot of things I can't control, but I always can control how I respond to those things. And the most important thing I can control every moment of every day is will I choose God's way forward? Will I choose God's way forward? So I wanna give you three ways to do that. And here you see the first one. Mary chose to hear God's promise to fix what was broken. You know, Mary could have said when the angel started talking, uh, you know, thanks, but no thanks. I, I, I kind of appreciate what you're saying about me getting pregnant without Joseph and that there's a good plan in it, but that, that is just a little too uncomfortable for me. Mary could have put her hands up. She could have said, I don't really want to be part of this. And step one of her choosing God's way forward is that very simply, she said, I will hear God's plan to fix Not only what's broken in my life, but what's broken in all of the world. And this is what's so beautiful about Christmas. It's personal to you. Christ came to fix what's broken in you. What's broken in your habits, in your addictions, in your relationships. What's broken between you and God. He came to fix all of that so that you can have eternal life and you can have peace in this life and you can have freedom from addictive behavior and you can have restored relationship. He came to fix what's broken in you. But he also came to fix what's broken in the other 7 billion people in the world. The 108 billion people who've ever lived in human history. The whole human story which is broken, he came to fix. And step one of choosing God's way forward is saying, God, I will hear your promises 
about how you will fix what's broken. Now, God's promises often seem impossible. Remember, for Mary, what it meant is as a poor peasant girl with no rights or education, living in a nation that is under the fist of another nation, I'm going to believe that my God will someday be born as a human and he will be a Messiah, he will be King of kings and Lord of lords, and he will set up an eternal kingdom. That sounded impossible, but she believed it. Now, here we are, and there are prophecies in Scripture that tell us that same Jesus who died on the cross, rose again, and has gone to heaven to prepare a place for us, he will return, and when he does, he will judge humanity. All who've trusted in him will be counted as righteous because of our faith in him and his work on the cross. And then scripture says, he will make all things new and everything that's broken, he will repair. And it says for followers of Jesus that he will wipe away every tear from our eye and we will be with him in a new garden of Eden, a new heaven and a new earth where there will be a tree of life. We will live for eternity. That's a beautiful promise, but it sounds kind of impossible, doesn't it? Just like Mary believed an impossible promise, we who follow Christ today We believe an impossible promise, but nothing is impossible with God. Step two, to choose God's way forward is to hear his promise. And then secondly, Mary personalized God's promise to her situation. That's a modern way of saying it, but we see that in Mary's word and her response. She realized, okay, God's promise is to fix all of humanity, but his promise is also for me. He wants to fix what's broken in me And he wants to use me in his story of helping others. The application here is to find a promise of God for your situation. I don't know where your Jenga tower of life is tilting or where it has toppled, but I do know this. There are hundreds of promises in scripture for you, and there are dozens that apply to that specific situation. You can find a promise of God that applies to you. Uh, Quick question survey, you don't have to raise your hand, but do you know this person in your life who is the early technology adopter when a new iPhone or new gadget comes out, they are the person who has to be one of the first ones to get it? Do you have such a person in your life? Maybe it's a spouse, relative, friend, coworker, and they're like, I I have to have it. Well, I'm super thankful for the early adopters in my life because I tend to just kind of be going about my life and they get the, the new thing, the new iPhone or whatever, and two or three years later, I finally get it. And then instead of having to read any instruction manuals or even having to Google, I have these living instruction manual people, friends, who say, here's how you do this, here's how you do that. Now, in my life, my wife Mel is one of those. When the first iPhone came out, she had one within a few months. I went two or three years. I had this old Palm Treo phone with a little keyboard on it, and I loved that thing. And, and Mel finally says, John, you're, you're like an old, old man. You're going to get left behind. The whole world is moving on. You have to get an iPhone. So I finally did. And, and sure enough, as soon as I got it, I realized, she's right. I was going to get left behind. This thing changed my life. So now whenever I have a you know, new piece of technology, it's usually Mel who will say, oh, did you know about this feature? And I'm like, I had no idea it could do that. So a little pro tip here. I'm going to share a technology tip for you guys, okay? Now, some of you, especially the younger ones, you're like, yeah, yeah, this is boring. But others of you are going to be like, whoa, I had no idea I could do that, okay? I want to teach you how to take a screenshot on your phone, okay? (laughs) Because if you're like me, you know, there was a little while where I was like, how do people do that? How do they text me a picture of their screen? That's so cool. How do they do that? So I was asking Mel. This this was a while ago. I've known this for a while, okay? But... (laughs) She said, it's really simple. You just push the home button and the sleep button at the exact same time. And of course, like the first time I try it, I put the phone to sleep. I'm like, it didn't work. I just put the phone to sleep. She's like, no, you have to have it at the exact same time. So you practice a little bit and then you get it down. Now I'm, you know, taking screenshots all the time. And, you know, so, so here's your tech tip today. If you don't know how to take a screenshot, push the home button and the sleep button at the exact same time, you've got a screenshot. Now here's the thing. I carried an iPhone around for a number of years before I knew how to do that. My phone still has hundreds of features that I don't even know how to take advantage of. And that for me is symbolic of the Christian life because you see God gives a promise for the exact situation that you're going through. But I wonder, do you know the features of his word? Do you know the promises that he's given to you? 
There's a verse that says, in Christ, all the promises of God are yes and amen, or that's right. In other words, if you've placed your faith in Jesus, every positive promise in the Bible applies to you. And when you go through a hard time, yes, you kind of dig in and say, well, I just have faith, I'm gonna believe, that's good, but your, your faith can get personalized and you can claim a promise that is specific to your situation. So how do you know those promises? Well, I'll give you three really simple ways. First is to do what you're doing today. Every time you gather here on a weekend, my job is to open up this device, the word of God, and say, here are the features. So by being here, you're learning God's promises. Another way is to have friends like I do with my wife, Mel, and some of my other friends who say, here's how it works. And that's why we have small groups here. And that's why if you don't have some Christian brothers or sisters who are on the journey with you, maybe you have breakfast once a week or you're in an official small group here or you're in some kind of Bible study, you'll have times where you say, I'm going through this, I don't know what to do. And another believer will come alongside and say, oh, I was in the same situation and here's what God taught me. The third way you can learn the features is to read them for yourself. And if you don't have a Bible that you love reading, we'd love to get you one today. On your way out in the lab, you'll see uh, a table. We're selling these life application study Bibles. And if you can't afford one, we'll be happy to give it to you. This is my favorite Bible because this specific layout of scripture is what changed my life when I started really seeking Jesus in my life. And it's like having a really, really loving but smart pastor with you every time you open the Bible. And I love it because it has an alphabetical index in the back of subjects, so you can look up subjects like you know money, sex, greed, jealousy, taxes, anything. You look it up, and it'll show you the passages that talk about that, and you can find the promises of God that apply to you. For example, I remember right after I finished my undergrad, I was working as a newspaper journalist, and I really wanted to find my life partner. I was like, ah, I, I just, I, you know, I want to I wanna find someone who's committed to me for the journey, and just, you know, it wasn't working out for some reason. I don't know why. I don't, I don't know why I kept getting rejected, okay? And, and I was reading one day, and there's this verse in Proverbs that says, finish your outdoor work and plant your fields and then build your house. And for me at that time in my life, it was like, you know what? I just need to focus on doing my job well and becoming good at what I do and loving God and really being a strong Christian. And eventually he will build my house. And, and he did. And that was a promise that I needed for that season. But I knew it because I was just reading this every day. So if you don't have one, grab one on your way out. God gives a promise for your situation. Let me show you just a few of these promises. There's hundreds of these features, okay? But here's just a few of them. We have the promise of salvation and eternal life. And on your outline, I've put the scripture references for each of these. But, you know, I think of different families in our church, different people in our church and what they're going through in life right now. There's a family in our church who recently lost a newborn child. That newborn was, was born prematurely, and they had hoped and dreamed that the baby would be healthy, but that baby went home to heaven. And they're grieving and they're confused and they're disturbed like Mary was, but in it, I see them clinging to this. They know that that baby is not lost. They know that that baby is in God's presence and the day is coming, 60, 70 years from now, where they will be together with that child for all of eternity. So yes, they are believing in God in a big sense, but they're clinging to very specific promises of eternal life that we will be reunited with all who've gone before us who've placed their faith in Christ. I also know, ironically, within a congregation this size, that there is right now a young woman who doesn't want to be pregnant because she's not supposed to be pregnant, and she's embarrassed that she's pregnant. And there's all sorts of options before her of what to do. And there's the temptation in our culture to take that human life so that her life would be easier. And for her, God gives the promise in Romans chapter eight that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We all make mistakes. We all mess up. God tells us that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And as a follower of Jesus, when you mess up, you confess it to God, you get back on track, but you turn to God with it and you say, God, work this for good. And I know that for that young lady, if she will choose God's way forward, just like Mary did, 
that God will bless her, God will bless that child, and God might even bless another family that wants to have a child but can't. There's a passage in Jeremiah that says, uh, God says, here are the plans I have for you, not to harm you, but to prosper you. And that's a promise that others in our church are holding on to right now. God guarantees in Romans chapter 8 that he will work all things together for good, even the very difficult things in your life. He's not the author of evil, but he can turn it for good if you will turn to him. Each of these has a verse that you can, you can circle this on your outline if you're like, that's the one I need. You can look that verse up. You can memorize that verse just like you'd memorize the features on your phone. God promises you peace regardless of your circumstances. He promises you wisdom in James chapter one. If anyone needs wisdom, ask of God and ask with faith and he'll give it to you. Second Corinthians one verse 20 says that every promise of God is yes in Christ Jesus. Like Mary, you can choose God's way forward. And the third step to doing that is to believe. Believe God's good plan for you even when it seems impossible. And this one's all about your will. This is all about your choice, just like Mary made that choice. I wonder, will you choose to believe God's impossible promises? That's what Mark and Shannon are doing right now. Mark and Shannon are going through this unexpected, premature birth of their son, Bryson. And in it, they're modeling for us what it is to hear God's promises, to personalize them to their situation, and then to say, we believe in God's promises. Mark's been writing a blog. He writes it from Bryson's perspective. And uh, if you read it, bring a box of Kleenexes, because I cry every time I read Mark's blog about Bryson, who was born at about one pound and is up to about two pounds, 10 ounces now. But everything's there. He's this fully formed little guy, 28 weeks, when an abortion is still legal, com still legal completely formed human being. And here's what, here's what Mark wrote. He said, being a parent in the neonatal intensive care unit is full of ups and downs. This week has been a roller coaster. Mark describes how they did some x-rays and they learned that Bryson has some broken limbs, which are common with um, those premature births. But the good news is his vitamin D levels are where they're supposed to be and he's gaining weight. Mark goes on to write that he's now the largest he's been He's almost three pounds. He's gained three centimeters in one week. And I love this next part because, Mark, you're going to hear the confusion, the disturbed that was true of Mary, and it's true of all of us. It's not unspiritual to feel confused or disturbed or tired. Mark says this, Pray for me and Shannon that we continue to keep our faith and trust in the Lord. Pray that we can stay strong knowing we're both tired and stressed and we might snap at each other at times, but we are still madly in love and with God's help, we will make it through this. Mark says, thank you all for your support and prayers. We can never repay you. And then he writes this line that I put at the top of the screen here. A long road means a greater opportunity for God to shine. I got to pray with Mark and with Shannon last night and I got to see the faith that is in them. They're just as real and human as us. And they're in a moment where their Jenga tower got knocked over and their life plan is not what they wanted it to be. But just like Mary, they're turning to God. Here's a picture of little Bryson. You gotta, he looks a little angry here, but you just see how little he is. And he's with his older brother, who's also a miracle baby. And I just love his shirt. God has big plans. God has big plans for this little guy. And God has big plans for all who will trust in him. You can't control what happens to you in life, but you can always control, will I choose God's way forward? And God brought you here today to just know that he's got good promises for you. He's got good plans for you. The choice is up to you. Will you choose like Mary to say, God, I'm your servant. Show me your way forward and that's what I'll do.